How to create monsters for Dungeons and Dragons. There are several different ways to create monsters in 5th edition. The first and easiest is to see if there is already an existing monster you like. The official books are full of supernatural and mundane creatures. There's also loads of third party publishers that make their own monsters and plenty of homebrew content made by other DMs that you can try out. The problem is that these monsters may be too weak or strong for your party. So what else can you do? Well, you can reskin existing monsters to fit in with your idea. There's course reskinning, where you take any monster and just rename it. Job done, no skill required. It's super fast and easy, but you end up with odd inconsistencies that don't really make sense, like water creatures that are weak to fire, or really high con saves on a supposedly sickly creature. Also, your players will usually spot if you've just rebranded a kobold as a giraffe. Just saying. Another option is careful reskinning, where you take an existing creature, but this time you tweak it so it fits in better with your idea. The immunities, resistances and vulnerabilities can be swapped out. You can also change the damage types, attack names and maybe the weapons. Let's say we want to make a frost newt that uses a warhammer. Just take the fire newt from Volo's guide, swap anything that says fire for cold, swap the ignan language to aquan, then change the scimitar attack to a warhammer and the damage from 1d6 slashing to 1d8 bludgeoning. Done. This takes an extra minute or two, but it's definitely worth it. If that's all you needed, then thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. But if you've got the guts, the wit, and a bit of time, you can create your own unique monster from scratch. The ingredients for this monster gumbo are a sheet of paper, a pencil, plus one or equivalent, the monster manual, and about four pages from the Dungeon Master's Guide. You might also want the player's handbook. More about that later. The method of creating monsters given in the DMG is a bit wonky. It's got everything there, but it's all jumbled up in the wrong order, so I've untangled it to make things easier. Like the rest of D&D, monster creation is built on general rules with a few exceptions that override them. It's no different from character creation really. You just need to follow through all the steps. I'm going to run through each one in order with an example creature so you can see what's going on. Step 0. Specific concept and purpose. What's the monster's job? Why do you need it in your game? Monster rolls? Um, yeah. So, in my example, the players want to get inside a magic paper mill. I need a creature to guard the entrance against intruders. So, uh, let's make some sort of paper monster, as that fits the setting. Uh, it just stands there and bars the way. So, maybe some kind of paper construct or a golem? Keep it simple. Remember, we're not trying to make an NPC, just a creature. Once you have your concept, and why you need a monster, move on to the next step. Step 1. Challenge Rating and Difficulty If you're building a specific monster for your game, you should have a good idea of what you're up against. How many players do you have, what level are they, and how difficult do you want this creature to be? This is where the DMG gets things wrong. This is the last question it asks, rather than the first. I'm making it for my players to face, so I need to know what I'm aiming for. The challenge rating or CR system does take a bit of a bashing, as every group is different and you can't accurately calculate how cunning, or lucky, your players will be. Also, a lot of people don't understand the maths, so they don't give it a fair chance. Anyway, a single monster should theoretically be a medium challenge encounter for four characters of the same level. A monster two levels greater will be a hard challenge, and four CR levels above will be deadly. You can ignore easy encounters entirely, they're just an annoying resource tax, unless you want to make a tutorial fight for new players. For my example, I want a medium difficulty encounter for my four level five players, so I'm going to make a single CR5 monster. That's my target set, CR5. Step two, how big is it, and what type of monster will it be? There are different size categories in D&D. Tiny, small, medium, large, huge and gargantuan. I'm making a walking doorstop, so I'm going with large. D&D has standard monster types. I'd recommend sticking with one of these so that your character abilities and spells like favoured enemy don't need altering too. It also helps to look at existing monsters of the same type to get ideas later on. I'm going to go with construct for my monster type. Step 3. Immunities, Resistances and Vulnerabilities 
You don't have to have any of these, but it can flesh out the monster, and also, giving a specific weakness or strength, can reward players that use knowledge checks or are observant during combat. I've gone to extremes here, but you probably only want one or two of each. Sticking with my paper theme, I've gone with Vulnerable to fire, slashing and piercing. Paper also suffers when it gets wet. Water isn't a damage type in D&D, but we can use it somewhere else later on to reinforce the player's expectations of what ought to be effective. Resistant to bludgeoning? Yeah, sure, why not? Immune to poison and psychic damage because it's a construct. Condition immunities. Ah, now this is a little different and is used to ignore specific status effects. I'm making an unliving construct, so let's do immune to charmed, frightened, deafened, poisoned, exhaustion, paralyzed, and petrified. Step 4. Armor. Does it wear manufactured armor or use a shield? Does it have natural armor from a tough hide or shell? Does it have nothing special at all? For manufactured and shield, choose from the armor table in the PHB, just like for a player character. If you use a shield, remember you can't also use a two-handed weapon at the same time, just like for players. For natural armor, or nothing, just mark down your choice and ignore it for now. My monster isn't wearing anything, but has natural armor, so that's all I need to write down. Next. Step 5. Special Senses, Movement and Languages Does the monster have any special sight or hearing? Well, my paper creature stands by a door day and night, so I'm going to give mine 60 foot dark vision and leave it at that. Can it fly, climb or swim? Does it go really fast or really slow? I don't have any special movement in mind, so I'm going to leave the base walking speed at 30 feet. That's it. Does it speak and what languages can it understand? This depends on the monster type, but unless you're making an NPC, I'd stick to common, and that'll do. If I'm going with a golem, it won't speak. So I can do understands language of its creator, common, but can't speak. Alignment? Uh, lawful neutral? I mean, all he does is guard a door. Step 6. Skills. Monsters can choose from the same 14-odd skills that players get as well as tools and instrument proficiencies. But like languages, almost all of them don't make any difference in combat, and you'll just be giving yourself more work to do for something you'll never use. Skill proficiencies are just used to add the proficiency bonus to increase the modifier. Your monster can always attempt a roll, even if it's not trained, just like a player. To simplify things, I'd only worry about stealth, insight, and perception, as these will come up the most. A uh, push, maybe athletics, but only if you're making a grappler. Our paper monster isn't the most observant of watchmen, so we'll have exactly no trained skills. Step 7. Traits, Abilities and Attacks This step is the most fun, but is also probably the most difficult. You can make up traits and attacks completely from scratch, but I'd recommend going through the monster manual and picking some that you think would fit your creature. You don't need to reinvent the wheel completely. Monsters can always take class abilities and spells from the player's handbook too. Just like with reskinning monsters, you can rename or swap out parts to make them fit your idea better. I'd suggest giving the creature no more than three different attacks, probably at least one ranged and one melee, as well as two to four fun traits, abilities or disadvantages that tie your idea together and make it fun to fight against. Don't worry about any damage or attack values yet, We'll come back to that later. If you want to use spells, then decide how the creature uses magic. Can it just naturally do it, like with mephits and demons? In which case, you want to give it the innate spellcasting trait. Or, does it cast spells like a player character? In which case, give it the spellcasting trait, like the flame skull or the sphinx. Innate spellcasting generally works for one or two spells only. Full spellcasting monsters will need spell slots just like players. If you want to do that, stick with one character class, choosing a character level, and give the creature the same number of spell slots, and choose spells from their class list. You might have seen as a third level wizard in the stat block. That's all you're doing really, copying a player character's spell options. Pick a couple of different spells that fit the theme, and use them in place of the monster's more mundane attacks. If you took mage armor, or bark skin, or something else that might boost their armor class, go back to step four and write that down. You're going to need it later. OK, so for my paper golem, I took these traits. Magic resistance to give it some spell protection. 
Aversion to fire from the flesh golem, which gives me a debuff and emphasizes the obvious fire weakness. I also took water susceptibility from fire elemental, so that smart players are rewarded with a bit of damage if they try and turn my poor beast into a soggy pulp. To make it more interesting, I rebranded the Galabdur's rolling charge ability as Scrunch. The golem crumples into a ball and rolls into a character to do extra damage and try and knock it prone. I then gave it three attacks. A basic slam attack which bludgeons the foe, a melee slashing attack I'm calling paper cut, and an attack called paper plane that has some sort of range. Um, dagger-like shards of sharpened paper are flung out in front of the golem. Something like that. Maybe a cone? As it's a solo monster meant to face the whole party, I also gave it multi-attack to boost its number of actions. I thought two attacks, one slam and one paper cut, seemed fair when compared to other CR5 monsters. The third, ranged attack, was best used on its own, as it's an area effect that could hit multiple targets. There's loads more you could do, maybe paper chains to restrain opponents, or some sort of origami style shapeshifting, but I don't want to overthink my monster too much. Three attacks, four traits, that's fine. Still with me so far? Great. That's all the artsy part over. Now for some hardcore integer based action. For science! We now need to fill in the stat block to give our monster the correct pluses and minuses. It might look like Watsy just stuck their finger in the air, but the monster maths follows the same rules that player characters do. Step 8. Proficiency bonus. Monsters use the same proficiency bonuses as players, and it goes up at the same level. This is a hard and fast rule, and isn't broken. The bonus never goes below plus 2, and can go up to plus 9. You can find the correct proficiency bonus for different challenge ratings on the table on page 274 of the DMG. Our creature is a CR5, so it has a proficiency bonus of plus 3. Easy. Step 9. Quick monster stats. Sticking with the table on page 274 of the DMG, you'll notice there are suggested values for defense and attack for monsters of a certain CR. Just write these down for now for the CR you're aiming for, so we can reverse engineer them later to help us. We're CR5, so that gives AC15, 131 to 145 HP, plus 6 to attack, 33 to 38 damage per round, and a save DC of 15. Step 10. Hit Dice. A monster's hit die is based on its size. Always. That's another rule. The dice size increases with the creature. Tiny is d4, small is d6, medium is d8, large is d10, huge is d12, and a gargantuan creature uses a d20. If you need to, you can find it on the chart on page 276. Our paper monster is large, so we're going to use a d10. Let's just look at that again for a second. That means our large creature has the same hit die as a fighter. The barbarian uses the same one as something huge. And the poor old wizard is stuck with the same category as a small creature. Write down the average HP per die while you're at it. In this case, it's five and a half. Step 11, ability scores. Monsters use the same six primary attributes as players, and they all act in the same way. You can take a look at a similar size and see our creature to give you an idea of what numbers to put in. The average value is a 10. Is your monster going to be above or below average with each ability? What is it terrible at? What is it best at? My paper golem has good strength and con, but rubbish intelligence and is below average at everything else. I decided on strength 18, dex 9, con 18, int 6, wisdom of 9, and a charisma of 8. Oof, bad mentals. Then give them the right ability score modifiers, just like with player characters. If you need it, the formula is ability score minus 10 divided by 2. So that gives me a strength of plus 4, dex minus 1, con plus 4, int minus 2, wisdom minus 1, and a charisma of negative 1. Okay, still with me? Moving on. Step 12. Generating hit points. Take the average HP range you got back in step 9. Do you think this is too much, too little, or just about right for your monster? If it seems too high, pick the range for the next CR down. If too low, go up to the next one. I think a 131 to 145 HP range is okay for my golem. I'm going to go closer to the lower end, I think. My hit dice from step 10 was a D10, with an average result of 5.5. And my constitution modifier from step 11 was plus 4. We can fiddle around with the numbers to see how many dice we need to roll for HP. 
the number of dice equals the target HP divided by the average hit die result plus your con mod. Whoa, that, say that again. The number of dice rolled equals the target HP divided by the average hit die result plus the con mod. In my case, number of dice equals 131 divided by 5.5 plus 4 to get 13.79. Then I rounded it up to the nearest whole number, in this case 14. This gives me the number of dice to roll. You can then put this number back in to get your actual average HP. In my case, 14 times 5.5 plus 4 is 133. So my average HP is 133. Usually they put the die and then a static modifier. So do the con mod times the number of dice. 14 times 4 is 56. The HP total is then written like this in the stat block. Average or number of dice plus static modifier. If you get stuck, just copy your numbers into the equation I've put on the screen. That's the worst of the maths, honest. Step 13. Armour class. Remember step 4? Good old step 4, so long ago. If your monster uses manufactured armour, give them the AC from the armour table in the player's handbook. Remember to add your dex mod where needed, and also account for a shield, if you're using one. Done. If your creature has no armour at all, their AC is the same as for player characters. 10 plus the prof bonus plus dex. If we had that for the golem, it'd be 10 plus 3 minus 1 equals 12. That's not very good. The suggested value from the table for a CR5 was 15. Luckily, we chose natural armour for our monster. This time we can set our own value. I went with an AC of 17. Just above the target, but that's okay, this monster's tough. Remember to include the plus 2 AC for a shield user and any bonus from mage armour or any other defensive spell you gave to the creature that they're likely to cast. You can always reverse calculate what your AC modifier should be from the target number. For no armour, your dex mod needs to be the target AC minus 10 minus the prof bonus. For natural armour, the armour bonus you make up needs to be target AC minus 10 minus dex mod. If we did that, and took apart my 17 AC, we'd find that my natural armour bonus gives a plus 8. Awesome. Step 14. Passive Perception and Proficiencies. While we're at it, let's do a bit more adding. Calculate the skill modifiers for any of your trained skills. In my case, I have no trained skills, so I can ignore that part. Then work out the monster's passive perception. Passive Perception is 10 plus the Perception Wisdom modifier. My Passive Perception score is 10 plus my Wiz mod, which is 10 minus 1 for 9. Who said that? You can also do Initiative. Initiative is normally equal to your Dex mod, unless you took a special trait like the Swashbuckler's Rakish Audacity. My Golem's Initiative is a mighty negative 1. Well, we're not going first. Now we can do Saving Throw proficiencies. Monsters can be proficient in saving throws just like players. Pick one or two that you think fit your idea. Now you can add the proficiency bonus to the ability modifier to get the saving throw modifier. I've doubled down on my golem's best abilities and given it proficiency in strength and con saves with a proficiency bonus of plus three and a strength and con modifier of plus four. That gives me three plus four equals plus seven to each save. Saving throws strength plus seven Con plus 7. Away win. Step 15. Wow, this just keeps on going, doesn't it? Attack bonus and save DC. Monsters are always proficient in their attacks. Fact. Therefore, you always get to add the prof bonus to the attack rolls they make. Weapon attacks always use the strength or dex modifier as appropriate. All creatures with the innate spellcasting trait use charisma for attacks and saves. So if you have that, add charisma instead. Those with the spellcasting trait use the same ability mod as the class they've copied their spells from. Wizard off Int, Druid off Wisdom, whatever. My Golem has the Slam Attack, which is plus 3 proficiency, plus 4 strength mod, to get plus 7 to hit. They also have the Paper Cut Attack, plus 3 proficiency, plus 4 strength mod, also plus 7 to hit. So what about save DCs? Save DCs are equal to 8, plus your proficiency bonus, plus the ability modifier, just like with characters. For those with a spellcasting trait, use the relevant spellcasting class ability modifier from before. 
For innate spellcasting, use the Charisma mod again. But what if neither of those is relevant? Well, monsters in the Monster Manual that make the player roll a saving throw from a natural or physical attack use their Con modifier. This seems to be a consistent rule. Our golem's safe DC is therefore 8 plus 3 for the prof bonus plus 4 for the con modifier to give you a total of 15. As a check, let's look again at our target numbers from the table back in step 9. See our 5 monsters should have a to hit of plus 6 and a save DC of 15, so we're pretty close. Step 16, weapon damage multipliers. A monster's damage is based on its size, fact. For every size above medium, increase the number of dice you roll by 1. So, a medium creature attacking with a scimitar uses a d6. A large creature with the same weapon uses 2d6, and a huge creature does 3d6 damage. My monster is large, so all my attacks use 2 dice for damage. Step 17. Damage. If you use spells, you can just copy the spell damage and effect from the PHB. But if not, you'll have to do the following. What sort of weapons does the monster use for its attacks? Does it use manufactured weapons like swords or daggers, or natural weapons? If it uses manufactured weapons, just take the damage die and type straight from the weapon table in the PHB. It's that simple. Melee weapons use the monster's strength modifier, as do thrown melee weapons. Ranged weapons use the dex mod, just like with players. If the weapon is versatile or finesse, you can change the die and which modifier you use, so be careful. If the monster uses natural weapons like stingers or hooves, then find another monster that has the same thing and use the same die. If it's something you made up, choose a die size you think fits in. Will the attack do as much damage as being hit by a great axe or more like a dagger? You choose, you can always adjust it later. Just like with equipped weapons, by default, melee attacks use strength, ranged uses dex. Remember to increase the number of dice based on size from the previous step and allow for any traits that you added that boosts damage, like the bugbear has. If you're forcing a save, pick the ability you think the attack would be most likely to target. You can add the to hit modifier and save DC from step 15 as well. Our paper golem has three attacks. Slam, which does two times a D8 plus strength modifier damage, or two D8 plus four bludgeoning. Paper cut, which does two times D8 plus strength modifier damage as well, for two D8 plus four slashing while the paper plane attack is a DC 15 dex save in a 15 foot cone, or take 2d8 plus strength modifier damage on a failure, which equals DC 15 dex save or 2d8 plus 4 piercing. I use strength instead of dex for my ranged attack because the golem is throwing a melee weapon like a hand axe or a spear, rather than firing a bow. I also have one trait that adds damage. Scrunch, or rolling charge, do an extra 2d8 bludgeoning damage on a slam attack if the monster rolls at least 20 feet before hitting the target. On a hit, the target must also succeed on a DC 15 strength save or be knocked prone. All my attacks are natural ones, so I could pick my own die. I use d8s for all of them to save me die swapping at the table and to keep things simple. Step 17b, exceptions and secret source. Well, technically, I think you'll find that some creatures don't obey all of those rules. Actually, they do. Welcome to the murky world of the secret trait. Let's take a look at page 318 of the Monster Manual. The Black Bear is a challenge half creature, so will have a proficiency bonus of plus 2, and has a strength modifier of plus 2. It has two attacks, claws and a bite, which are melee, so they should be using strength. Therefore, following our rules from before, the attack bonus should be proficiency bonus plus strength modifier. 2 plus 2 equals 4. However, as you can see, the to hit for both attacks is actually a plus 3. So what's going on there then? The proficiency bonus is fixed, and the attacks are close quarters, so they shouldn't really be off decks. Hmm, the plus 1 wisdom modifier would work, but the bear doesn't use spells, so that doesn't make much sense either. Let's take a look at the damage. The damage modifier should match the ability modifier they've used. Ah, plus two. Right, so it was strength after all. So what are our options? Either this is a typo, and it should actually be plus four, or Watsy have introduced a secret trait that gives the bear negative one to hit. The bear does get multi-attack, and a druid can wild shape into it at only level two, so perhaps this was done for game balance for playtesting. Maybe they thought bears should be bad at hitting things, so gave it a debuff. Let's look at another one. 
same page, the bat. Most of the tiny beasts have a weak source attack that only does a nominal one damage. Okay, that's like the player's unarmed attack, but the to hit bonus is wrong again. And what about damage modifiers? The bat is a challenge zero, so also has a prof bonus of plus two. All creatures are proficient in their own attacks, we know that from before. The bat has a bite attack, with plus zero to hit, and only one damage. Hmm. With a strength mod of minus four, and plus two prof bonus, should equal minus two to hit, and one minus four damage. Uh, you can't have a minus to hit, and minus three damage is just dumb. We also don't have a stat with minus two to cancel out the proficiency, so it looks like another secret trait. I'm calling this one Tiny Terror. This creature's attacks cannot be lower than zero, and it does a minimum of one damage. If we look at the Badger, which has a plus two proficiency bonus, and an attack that deals one damage, it actually has plus two to hit. So what's going on there? The Badger could be using the same Tiny Terror trait, or their melee attack could use a finesse weapon and come off dex. If they use dex for their bite attack, the prof bonus plus a zero dex modifier would give plus two to hit and plus zero damage mod. So there's lots of slightly confusing and different ways to get the same result, even if it isn't always called out in the text. This is no different to the natural armor bonus we arrived at back in step 13. If the numbers don't seem to fit in the stat block, you may have just discovered another hidden trait. Shh, it's a secret to everybody. Except Merle's. I think he's in on it. Step 18. Average damage. Now we have all our attacks mapped out, we can work out the average damage for each one. This will give us the damage number shown outside the brackets on the stat block. Just like with hit points, we need to know the average roll for each of our damage dice. It's half the maximum result, plus 0.5. All my monster's damage comes from d8s, so the average result is 4.5. Slam does 2d8 plus 4. If we use the average result, we get 2 times 4.5 plus 4, or 13 damage. Paper cut also does an average 13 damage, and paper plane does an average 13 damage, because they all use the same numbers. Scrunch adds 2d8 to the slam attack. 2 times 4.5 is 9. If you remember, the average damage per round for a CR5 monster was 33 to 38. You can check this by getting the average damage over three combat rounds, assuming all your attacks hit. If they use spells, pick the ones you think they will use the most. So, my golem will use Paper Plane on round one and do 13 damage. Then, multi-attack with a slam and paper cut on round two for 13 plus 13 equals 26 damage, and on the third round, we'll use Scrunch before doing the multi-attack to give 13 plus 13 plus 9 damage, or 35. That gives a total of 13 plus 26 plus 35, equals 74 damage. Now divide it by three rounds to get the average, and that gives a damage per round of 25. This is a little below the target, but that's okay. If we only spammed the most damaging attack, I'd get 35, which is right in the middle but repeating attacks over and over again gets boring, so I'll stick with 25. Step 19, trait modifiers to CR. Some features make a creature easier or more difficult to fight, so we need to check those first to see what their impact is on the creature's challenge rating. Write any CR modifiers down separately. You won't need them on the stat block at all, and they don't override any of the previous steps. We just need them to calculate our CR. If your monster has any special traits or actions, check the table on page 280 to 281 of the DMG. If any of them appear, write down the effect. For my golem, the only trait that comes up is magic resistance. This effectively increases my AC by two. So I've written down effective AC is 17 plus two equals 19. If you gave your monster a flying speed and a ranged attack and were aiming to get a CR 10 or lower monster, then you can add an extra 2 to its AC. I didn't, so I can ignore this. If your monster has more than 2 resistances, immunities or vulnerabilities, it alters their effective hit points. The table on page 277 of the DMG shows the effect. Vulnerabilities half your effective hit points, while resistances and immunities multiply it. I have 1 resistance, so I can ignore it, but I have 3 vulnerabilities and 2 immunities, so let's include those. 
for CR5, I times my HB by 2 for the immunities, and then I half it for the vulnerabilities. Effective average HP is 133 times 2 for immunities divided by 2 for vulnerabilities equals 133. So it cancels each other out. Therefore, my HP remains unchanged. We're on the home straight now. Step 20. Calculate offensive CR. You will need the highest attack bonus, the damage per round, and the save DC that we calculated from steps 15 and step 18. Remember to use any modified versions that we came up with during step 19 if they've changed. I have an attack bonus of plus 7, 25 average damage, and a save DC of 15. Take a look at the table on page 274. First look for your damage in the damage per round column and read across to see the CR. Mine is 25, so the CR is 3. Does the monster use more attack rolls or does it use more attacks that force a saving throw? Mine's going to be attack rolls, so now I go down the table until I see the first plus 7 attack bonus and then I read across the row to get the CR. For plus 7, it's a CR of 8. That's 5 higher than we had before. For every two points of difference, the CR changes by one. So my original CR of three goes up by two points to five. That gives me a final offensive challenge rating of five. Step 21, calculating defensive CR. To work out defensive CR, we need the average hit points and armor class. Again, remember to take into account any changes you made in step 19. From step 19, my effective AC was increased, so I'm going to use 19. My average hit points stayed the same at 133. As before, use the table on page 274. Go down the hit points column until you find your value, and then read across to get the CR. My 133 gives me a CR of 5. Now read the AC value of the same row. In my case, it should be 15. Depending on what it is, raise or lower the CR by 1 for every 2 points of difference. My effective AC is higher, so my CR will increase. Effective AC minus chart AC is 19 minus 15 to give me 4. So in my case, the defensive CR increases by 2 from CR5 to CR7. That gives me a final defensive challenge rating of 7. Step 22. Calculate total CR. Now we can put everything together to calculate the monster's overall challenge rating. We're aiming for a CR5 monster, so let's see how we did. We take the average of steps 20 and 21. Offensive CR plus defensive CR divided by 2 gives us the total challenge rating. So for my paper golem, 5 plus 7 divided by 2 equals 6. Uh, my total challenge rating for this monster is a 6. Uh, nailed it. Step 23, making adjustments. It's okay if the CR is a little off. If you want, you can go back and adjust things to make it fit. In my case, my defensive CR was a little too high. I could remove the magic resistance trait to lower my effective AC, or maybe I could lower my con score to reduce my hit points. But if I did that, I'd have to go through and make sure I changed anything that uses con, like my save DC. If you're way off, Go back through it one step at a time and see what you could add or take away to adjust the numbers up and down. Step 24. Calculate XP and encounter difficulty. Right, let's finish this one off. Look at the experience point chart on page 275. Find the CR of your monster and write the XP total down. I have a CR <coughs> 6 monster, so my XP is 2300. Now go all the way back to step 1. I was after a medium challenged monster for a party of four level five characters. Take that XP value and divide it by your number of players. So for me, 2300 zero, zero divided by four is 575. That means this monster will give 575 XP to each player after it's defeated. Go to pages 82 to 83 of the Dungeon Master's Guide and adjust the encounter XP for how many monsters you have and your number of players. I have one monster only and four players, so my value doesn't change. Now look up the character's level and the XP on the XP threshold chart on page 82. I have character level 5 and 575 XP, so my encounter difficulty is just over medium. So, even with a CR6 creature, 
it can still be a fair encounter. It's slightly more XP, but this is just a guideline after all. Whew! Well that was a bit of a mission, but we got there. All I need to do now is write down the details in a stat block, and we can get playing. What do you mean I haven't given it a name yet? Ugh, alright then. Step 25. Names. Well, I keep saying paper golem, so let's go with that. Somehow, construct of unliving pulp doesn't really have much of a ring to it. Right, that's your lot. How to make monsters for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons from scratch. If you'd like an alternative to the official method, Giffy Glyph has made a cool monster maker based on the old 4th edition encounter building. Take a look for yourself, I'll put the link below. I'll also write up my creature's stats properly, and stick it on the Twitter page, at plus one pencil. How do you make your own monsters? What abilities would you have given my paper golem? Let me know downstairs. Thanks for watching. Take a rummage in my description box for more content on this topic, and subscribe for more plus one wisdom. See you next time!